Good morning. Welcome to our worship service on Valentine's Day. Hopefully there's not a lot of guys uh, right now going, oh, that's right. <laughs> Valentine's Day, a special day, a day of Christian love, a day of uh, love and marriage, love and families. And uh, it's a day we're also going to focus on Christian love and especially with marriage in our, our service today. It's not often Valentine's Day falls on a Sunday, so... Uh, a fitting theme for today. Our service will follow as it's printed in our bulletin today. We'll begin by singing hymn 498. That's in the back of the worship folder on page 10. God bless our Valentine's Day worship.
open with the responses back on page three. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Unless the Lord builds the house, unless the Lord watches over the city, in vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. Sons are a heritage from the Lord, like arrows in the hands of a warrior. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray. Have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Almighty God, we thank you for the love with which you have loved us, sending your own Son as our Savior. Through Jesus, we have eternal life and salvation. We pray that we would display this love in our lives, especially in our families, that you may be glorified and that others may see your love in us. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Father, you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We now turn to our scripture readings today on love and marriage and families. And uh, here we read from Genesis chapter 2, uh, one verse also from chapter 1, the institution of Christian marriage in the family. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air, he brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. 
And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And from chapter 1, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. This is the word of the Lord. second reading today is from the New Testament book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, a famous section on love. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. This is the word of the Lord. In our gospel reading, we read from Matthew chapter 19, uh, words of Jesus concerning marriage. Haven't you read, Jesus replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together let man not separate. This is the gospel of the Lord. Before we continue with the next hymn, uh, we'll offer a children's devotion at this time. Uh, we haven't been having the kids uh, come up here, uh, but uh, you can stay where you're at as we have that devotion. And online, if you're tuning in, they can move a little closer to the screen. Well, with the permission of our 
flower, ladies. I'm going to remove one and talk about this. You know, on Valentine's Day, you might have seen all around the neighborhood, kids, people selling these on corners. Or maybe your mom took you to the grocery store and they have a flower department. You might have seen a, a little crowd over there the last couple of days because people are, are buying flowers. So kids, think about this. Why would someone give somebody else flowers on Valentine's Day? Well, there's, there's a few reasons I think we can we could guess. One is they're very beautiful, and so someone has beautiful feelings for another person. Uh, maybe their wife, maybe their husband, maybe their teacher, maybe a parent. Well, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. Please take this beautiful gift because I, I have beautiful feelings about you. What else about flowers? Smell beautiful. Fragrant. Maybe we could think of actions. I like to do beautiful things for you. Help you. Say beautiful things. Follow through on promises and things. Surely can be very beautiful. You know, as we think of Christian love, Christian love is not just saying it, but it's being it. And if there's anything a flower is, it's a beautiful thing all around. But there's one other thing I want to I'll share with you at this children's devotion, too. If you cut a flower, kids, you know what's going to happen to it? What's going to happen to this, this beautiful arrangement by next Sunday? We probably are not going to have the same arrangement of flowers next week. Why not? Because flowers wither and they die. So I want you to think also, when you think of flowers, don't just think of beautiful feelings and beautiful actions and fragrances and things, but also just think of how Jesus shows his love for us because he laid down his life and he died for our sins. So probably a cut flower is a very good example of how God has loved us. And we also think in the Christian home about how we lay down our lives for others sacrifice ourselves, do things, put others first because of what God has done for us. So today, along with the rest of the world, I guess, you can think about flowers, but, but maybe now you can think about them a little bit more seriously and a little bit more specifically because of the wonderful way that they show God's love and that love that overflows from us to others too. We bow our heads and pray. Lord God, we thank you that on this Valentine's Day that we have the example of a flower, a beautiful thing, a fragrant thing, one that you've given us and also one that shows the love of Jesus. Help us to show the love of Jesus in our lives too. Amen. We'll continue with the next hymn printed on page 11, I believe, in the back of the worship folder.
the name of the God of love, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Down through time, people have had a lot of things to say about marriage and love. There have been some memorable quotes that, that people have had. Here's, here's a few today. There's someone who once said long ago, marriage is like a violin. It doesn't work without the strings. And when the music stops, the strings are still attached. Someone else once said, marriage begins when you sink into his arms and ends with your arms in the sink. Someone else once said, uh, keep your eyes wide open before marriage and half shut afterwards. Socrates once said, by all means marry. If you get a good wife, you will become very happy. If you get a bad one, you will become a philosopher. And that is also good. And finally, uh, someone once saw a sign in a paint store that said, husbands choosing colors must have note from wives. People have sure said a lot of things about marriage. Marriage is sure a unique institution. I guess some of those quotes, though, might lead a person to ask, why would anyone want to get married? Why would anyone want to do that? We could couple that with uh, pastoral counseling. You know, any one of our guys at our seminary, one of those young students, they, they probably can rest assured that the most counseling that they're probably going to do in their ministry, unless they have a super specialized area, is probably going to be marriage counseling. And then, what about the cost? What is the cost of a wedding? I looked that up this week. The average cost of a wedding in the United States in 2019 was about $34,000. Average wedding. So why, why would anyone want to get married? Today, that's a great question, especially on Valentine's Day. We're going to take a look at God's Word in Genesis chapter 2, which was our first reading for today, and we're going to be encouraged. We're going to be encouraged by what Scripture says about this institution, and we're going to be encouraged to keep marriage a holy estate. First of all, we're going to learn that it is a divine institution, and secondly, that it involves a human and a sacred commitment. We bow our heads and pray as we begin. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As we begin our look here, though, perhaps a couple disclaimers would be in order. After all, not everybody is married in our congregation. So we don't want anyone to think that they're left out of a sermon or they came to church and it's an irrelevant message for me today. No, not, not at all. First of all, the first disclaimer we should make is that the single life is a one that it can be glorifying God in a very acceptable way. People are not commanded to marry, and nobody should feel any guilt or pressure that they have to be married. A second thing is, too, if you're a child here or a younger person or middle-aged person and not married, I'll bet maybe you've thought about it. Maybe you've hoped for it, maybe you even dreamed about it, maybe I'll have a family someday. So you certainly look forward to the things that we're going to talk about in this message today. And I think whether you're young or whether you're old, whether you're married, whether you're a widower, whether you're in any stage of life, we, we all support marriage and speak up about it. And so we all want to know what God says about marriage as we do that. So with that said, we look in Genesis 2 where our reading began. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. God's institution... If, if we look at this account, there's some vivid words that we want to follow through here to see how God instituted this unique partnership. The first one is, not good. 
not good. It's, it's almost shocking that God says that at this point. After every day, he says, it's good. It's good. He looked, he saw, it was good, even perfect. Now, there wasn't any flaw in the man himself, no sin or flaw or wrong, but it was in the fact that he was incomplete. Man wasn't quite complete, yet he was alone, it says. It's kind of ironic that the Hebrew word for alone is bud. Bud, that's just a literal word. It's kind of funny because Adam didn't have a bud. He didn't have a buddy. The thing that was wrong is he was bud. And as he looks at the creatures, he's going to see that. In us, we've, we're made social creatures, aren't we? I mean, even if you like a lot of alone time and quiet time, you would be missing something if you didn't have the interactions of family and society. And, and God wants Adam to know that too. And so what does he do? He goes through this process of having him name all the animals. Boy, that shows Adam's perfect intelligence. Could you name all the animals? And Adam, Adam names them. But the point is, he doesn't have a bud out there. He is bud. Adam was not created as an animal. Man was made distinct from the animals, and he is not going to marry an animal. No, God's going to do something special so that the first purpose of marriage would be fulfilled. The first purpose for the marriage relationship is companionship, friendship, and that love. In God's fulfillment, we read in verse 21, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. You know, one thing you might wonder in reading those words is why did God go through that process to have to do this? Why did he have to go through all that trouble and all those details? Why would he have to create the woman that way? Couldn't he have just called her into existence? Let there be woman. Or couldn't he have just taken some of the, the dust of the ground and formed it into a woman? He didn't do that. Why would God do this? I, I think you'd agree with me that this is going to be a very special closeness and bond that he will have with her. She came from my body. She is like me. She is me. Moms, can you relate to that? Not an exact comparison, but a similar one might be God could have sent the stork to your house to drop off your baby. He could have sent the stork, as uh, movies or cartoons always show, just drop them off. I, you would have had love and joy. The stork brought a child. But you know what? I think any mother here can attest to carrying a baby inside of her, inseparably connected with her for nine months. There's going to be a bond for life that is going to be like no other. I carried you and I bore you. You were in my body. That bond in this lifetime will never, never be broken. Just ask her. Man can say that about woman. She is me and is part of me. What other vivid words do we hear here with God's institution? She will be a suitable helper for him. That word suitable is kind of interesting too. Literally, it means face-to-face, -face, like opposite each other, corresponding to each other, a counterpart to me. And the sense of it is, she's different from me, but in a way that completes me. You might think of two different wheels that you put together as gears and they work together, even different sizes or different shapes, but they, they fit perfectly and they work together. Suitable for me. She is not him. She is not a man. She corresponds to him, certainly physically, and also even emotionally. 
And if you look at this in practice with any married couples, you know, maybe in our church or maybe in your neighborhood or maybe that are friends, maybe you've marveled sometimes at how different the two are, but how they can be married. Now that they can work together, maybe they're very different emotionally, but in a way, when they work together and they complement each other, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing that works very well. They strengthen each other because of that. And then also, she is a helper to him. There are also different roles in the marriage bond. There is a leader and there is a helper. And it is clear that man has been made the spiritual leader and captain of his home. And the woman is the ultimate supporter, the ultimate helper for him and for that family. That is still in effect even today. And there is nothing demeaning about that. There is nothing that makes her less valuable, less intelligent, or having less of a role. No, they'll be much demanded of a wife and a mother in the family. But there are definitely lines of that leadership as they work together. Another vivid word is he brought. He brought her to the man. Presentation almost. And isn't it interesting that even in our weddings today, there's traditions with how the bride is to be presented. Uh, many couples, they'll say, I can't see the bride until that moment when the wedding is going to be happy. Can't see the bride on the wedding day. And there's even ways where she, she comes around the corner or the doors are flung open or something happening. Bam, when she is ready to be presented, that's the moment. In fact, Adam was so overcome at that moment, what did he do? Can you imagine a groom doing this? He, he was so overcome, she's presented to him, and he breaks out in a song. I don't know if your husband did that for you wives when you got married. He, he breaks out into the first love song that we have in Scripture. Maybe one more vivid word here, too. Be united. You know, in older times, uh, older translations said, cleave. For this reason, a man will be united to his wife, and the two will be one flesh. Here we undoubtedly see overtones of the second blessing of marriage, intimacy. Intimacy is given as a blessing to this couple, and only within the marriage bond is this to be enjoyed. These are the things that make marriage God's institution from the beginning. So we would never want to say marriage is a man-made institution. We would never want to say well, it's a development of progress in civilization. We would never want to say marriage is something for my great-grandma's time, a past time, and it was good then, but now we're in a little bit more liberated culture. We would never want to say Marriage can be changed or altered with what makes up a marriage. Marriage is God's institution. And yet you know as well as I do, we could go off on marriage today and lambast our society for how they have treated God's gift of marriage. You know, it's almost like a, a young man who gets a, gets a new sports car as a gift. Someone just says, here's a sports car. Go enjoy it. And it's awesome. It's amazing. Wow, look look at this Porsche. Look at this Lamborghini. It's amazing. And then he has a bit of a temptation to misuse it and abuse it and erase it and beat it to death or, or whatever. God's given an amazing gift to mankind, and yet how mankind has misused it at times. Of course, adultery is probably the, the most flagrant way. We hear that right in the Sixth Commandment, not committing adultery. Yet down through time, how many have even carried on with the relationship in adultery? We may also hear people around us uh, being promiscuous who say, I want to have the fruits of marriage and I want to experience those blessings of marriage, but I don't want to be married and I want to share that companionship and intimacy with anyone, anytime, and don't have to worry about marriage at all. Down through time, there have been men who have followed the custom of their day and have taken a number of wives. In fact, even some Bible-believing men were tempted to do this back in Bible times with disastrous results. Dirty material, dirty pornography is all around us and more accessible than ever before at any time in history, I think. 
There are also those who might have some sort of commitment to each other, not marriage, but some sort of commitment, and they say, well, we think it's, it's time for us to move in together. We can live together without marriage and enjoy all those blessings. Maybe they make excuses like, well, we need to test things out to see if it's really going to work here. Or they might say, everybody's doing it. There are also people in our society who deny the roles in a marriage, who say that the man is not the leader of the home, or the woman is not the suitable helper for the man. Maybe there's some men who lord it over their wife, and there's some women who chafe under his leadership. And, of course, there are people who have changed who the participants in marriage can be, saying that people other than one man and one woman are who can be joined in marriage. At times like that, we need to take off our hat and realize that it's God's institution that he has given us. Now let's look at it from a different angle too. Not only is this God's institution, but also looking at it from people's perspective, there also is a human and a sacred commitment that is made when people enter this estate called marriage. What does a person need to know and realize and think hard about before they enter marriage? In verse 24, it said, <clears throat> For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. In other words, there, there is a serious vow that a person is taking about their family perspective. Yeah, and what I mean by that is if... If you're not in your original home right now, living with your biological parents, if you're not there right now, you know how back in the day there was a time where that was your focus. And you think back to your family unit, you think of your bedroom and where you lived and where you went to school. Everything kind of flowed from that relationship. And a child's most important relationship is with their parents. Well, that changes. That will not be true anymore. Oh, you, they'll still see them. They'll still be there. They'll visit. But your perspective of life will be different now as there is another family unit and another person that is now the most important person in your daily life. Another thing is the permanence. Here we hear uh, Jesus say in our gospel reading, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Or well, Romans chapter 7 says, by law a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. There is a permanence. Marriage is a lifelong union. Ideally, you only stand at the altar and say, I only get married once. That's what you're thinking on your wedding day. And this is why the vow for marriage says, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, in good times and in bad, for better or for worse, till death do us part. Of course, some have kind of changed the vow to say, till something better comes along, until you're behaving in a way I don't care for, until I get bored and need to move on, until I think that we need to break this marriage bond. We never would want to say that, and how sad it is that there is almost an easy type of divorce that you can get today. One last thing with the human sacred commitment that we make, I think we see it in Adam's song that he sang. That song at the beginning was supposed to continue. But that courtship, the nurturing, the relationship was to continue. Is it always that way? You know, husbands, uh, it says in 1 Peter chapter 3, Husbands, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. We also hear in Ephesians 5, Husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Husbands, are you considerate and loving towards your wife this way every day? Are there times where the courtship ebbs? Are there times where you forget or become tunnel visioned? Where the courtship is lost and not spoken? Are there times where your harshness and your pigheadedness might run ahead and not be considerate of your wife? 
Husbands, we all need to take a lesson. And then to wives, it says in Proverbs chapter 21, better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and ill-tempered wife. Wives, are there days where you're a bit ill-tempered? Are there days where you're a bit quarrelsome? Where you have chafed in the relationship that you have with your husband, your spiritual leader? Are there days where you have not been the godly supporter that God has made you? You know, as we think about those things, and as we think about the sins of society, too, and sins of the past, we might be depressed on Valentine's Day, but we can't, we can't end here because this is not a depressing message, and marriage doesn't end on a depressing note. There could be some sadness, there could be some guilt, but hold it, God, God has some good news for you, and it's very interesting that God's good news to us is given in the illustration of marriage with how he looks at us. In fact, in the New Testament, it says in Ephesians 5, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. The love of Jesus is pictured as an ideal husband's love. Sacrificial, laying down his life, loving his people and his church more than himself. So when the guilt comes, when the sadness comes, and when failure comes, look to Jesus who showed the perfect husband's love. He died for you. Through him we're forgiven. Through whom marriages, him marriages are renewed. Through him there are new starts. Through him there is forgiveness. And it's very interesting, at the end of time in the book of Revelation, if you've ever read about the culmination of everything in heaven, how is the church presented to Jesus? as the bride of Christ, beautifully dressed in the robe of righteousness that he has provided to be happy forever. The picture of forgiveness and salvation is pictured in a marriage relationship, a spiritual relationship with our Savior Jesus. And this is going to be the motivation in your home and in your life for forgiving each other, for cherishing each other, for striving for unity together, for building each other up, for rejoicing every day, and for working hard at your marriage and in your family. So finally, uh, who would ever want to get married? We, we've heard jokes, we, we've heard the quotes. Well, it still is a wonderful blessing and still is the core of society that God has given us. Proverbs 18 says, he who finds a wife finds what is good, and receives favor from the Lord. So may we keep marriage as a holy estate. May we realize it is God's institution that cannot be changed and in fact is a great blessing for all of mankind. And may we realize what a human commitment it is in our own marriages or whether you counsel and, and support others who are married or, or speak up for it. And we pray that God would lead our world to realize what true marriage is and to honor it and be blessed through it. Amen. Now may the peace that surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in the true faith to life everlasting. Amen. On the top of page 8, let's confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As uh, we do on Sundays, we're not taking a formal offering with our group, but there is an uh, offering plate on the right side of the canopy here if you'd like to leave an offering at our worship service today. So we'll continue with the prayers and the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we offer a special prayer for Judy Laterman who is the mother of Mary Sanchez, 
and uh, she is very weak and uh, undergoing many health issues at this time. We pray for her. Lord God, marriage is most pleasing in your sight, for you have ordained it for our good, and you have promised to bless us. We ask your blessing, therefore, upon all the married couples in our congregations, whose hearts you have brought together in love. Give them richly of your Holy Spirit, so that they build their marriage on faith that continually looks to you for forgiveness and salvation, for health and protection, for guidance and help, as well as for every needed thing. May our married couples and also may married couples around the world build their marriage on unselfish love for each other, a love that seeks to imitate your own love for them. Help them to fulfill their vows to remain faithful at the sight of their spouse through sickness and health, through good times and bad. Help them to endure life's sorrows and to cope with life's hardships, ever being sources of strength and encouragement to each other. Do not allow their faith to be shaken in times of testing, nor let them resent their crosses that sometimes accompany marriage, but draw their hearts ever closer to you and lend your grace to forgive any hurts caused by the others. We also pray that all of us would support Christian marriage no matter our station in life. We pray for those who have been widowed among us that God would provide them with friendship and companionship. And we also pray for those seeking marriage that you would lead them to a wonderful partner that would fulfill these marriage promises to them in this life. Also, merciful God, according to your promise, you will never leave or forsake your believers. We pray that you would be with Judy Laterman at this time, be her shield and strength, overcome all the temptations of Satan in times like these to war against her soul and faith. Use this occasion to purify and strengthen her, and the good work that you have begun in her keep to the very end. Let her never lose sight of Jesus' cross and of you as a loving and merciful God who is ever present in her time of need and to whom she may go in the day of trouble for deliverance. We pray for her, Lord God, and for the family as they support her at this time. Hear us also as we pray together as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We sing the hymn on pages 12 and 13.
Would you please rise for our closing prayers and blessing? O oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please remain standing for the closing hymn verses on the back cover. Good morning again. Wonderful to be here today with you, uh, worshiping our Lord, and uh, boy, what blessings we've had on Sundays with our dry weather and uh, being able to gather together. We thank him for that. Just a couple notes. Uh, first of all, there are Valentine goodies over on our treat table there, individually packaged. Please enjoy those today. There's also hot chocolate over there, so uh, make sure you go over and check that out as well. Thank you to our wonderful uh, saint of a volunteer who uh, provided those for us this morning. A second thing is that this is the Wells, the Wisconsin Synods. I guess you'd call it the marriage primer. It's a thin paperback, but there's a lot of good stuff in here. Uh, I feel that every, every married couple should have this in our congregation and synod, building the Christian home. So we have eight copies of those, and we'd like to give one to any married couple here today. They're on the stand over there by the bulletins. We'd love to provide them free of charge. Our cost for them for the book and for shipping is about 10 bucks. If you'd like to take one and return that at some time, fine. If you wanna just take one, fine. This is, this is good to get out to any married couple. Read it, go through it, go through it with your spouse. You will only benefit from it. And I also put some of the best uh, marriage books over there also that I, I recommend. Some of them are a little longer and uh, they can be found online. I'll probably be sending out information on those in the Monday church email. There's four books over there. If you want to take a look at them and purchase them on your own, or I could order them for you if you want, 
One is written by a Missouri Synod Lutheran pastor called Marriage is Like Dancing. And the whole book compares the dance uh, between the two as a many, many good Christian illustrations on marriage. One of them is called The Five Love Languages. That's on how people express and they perceive love in different ways and personalities. And uh, it's very interesting to know as you're married to someone who might not have the same personality exactly as you. One is called Men Are Clams, Women Are Crowbars. And uh, that's about the genders, how men and women emotionally can be wired differently. So if that's something of interest to you with your marriage, the, the male and female and how they work together sometimes. And the final one over there is called um, Deepening Love for Marital Happiness, I think. Another, it's a longer book kind of like this. Check those out. Get one as you'd like or I'll order one for you if you want. And then finally, Lent begins this week. This week we have a special Ash Wednesday service. Check out the details in the bulletin. The newsletter said it will be outside in the afternoon so we could have communion in person. We are now allowed to gather in person inside with regulations and modifications. So we will be gathering inside and uh, 6.30, we're going to have church on Wednesdays inside. We're going to have Holy Communion and the imposition of ashes this Wednesday evening to begin. We will also be online if uh, you don't care to wear a mask and be in God's house. And uh, we're also going to have a small choir that's going to sing the music to us as that's an issue too uh, still, even despite the Supreme Court's uh, decision. So look for information on that. Ask me if you have any, but that'll be in our announcements as well. But that begins Wednesday. Any other announcements? Oh, we should know. The lemons. Uh, Stutz has brought lemons. They're over there in a box. Take a bag, take a box, take some along. They'd love to share with you today. And God bless the rest of your week.